How do you do? Taking measurements is critical in many workplaces and professions. Would a builder guess at the size of a house he's building? The man in this story tried to make his own yardstick of morality and measure himself, which didn't work, as he discovered, when his heart and mind and life were unshackled. From the crossroads of life, this is Unshackled, true life stories of real people, dramatized and produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Most of us cannot imagine what it's like to lose everything, to be homeless, sleeping in a car or in a park, scrounging for food. That's why Pacific Garden Mission keeps the doors open day and night, welcoming hundreds of men, women, and children who have nowhere to go. Thanks to generous friends who send financial gifts, the old lighthouse provides showers and fresh clothing, nourishing meals, and a safe place to sleep. Even medical and dental care are offered to resident guests in the mission. Best of all, each guest hears the good news that points them in a new direction, a life of purpose. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3220 in the series Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. You know, I've spent four years in the Corps, and I've seen a lot of the world. Marines are the best, but I've come to a conclusion. I can't wait to hear this. Doesn't necessarily pay to be a good guy. You've had too much to drink, Eddie. I've never finished a can of beer in my life. Now you're kidding. Nope. I've opened seven cans in four years and I haven't finished one. Then what ails you? Look around you at the world. That old saying, good guys finish last, is right. If you follow the bad guys around long enough, you might find out they don't finish so great either. Maybe, maybe not. I'm just saying. So what's the plan now that you're about to be a civilian again? I think I'll be a policeman. Yeah? The Corps is good training for that. The Corps is good training for anything. So you plan to be a crooked cop? Not crooked. Just an opportunistic one. And where do you plan to start? Why not at the top? New York City. The man in our story was born in London and came to the U.S. by way of Canada. He had big plans that didn't work out the way he expected. This is the story of Eddie Quinn from the classic files of Unshackled. I was born the year World War II began in Europe, so I lived through the bombing of London. But my only real memory is the buzz bombs that flew over late in the war. We held our breath, listening as they approached. If the sound of the engine stopped when the bomb was passing overhead, we were in trouble, because the bomb would fall straight down on us. One did fall in the garden and damage the corner of our house. After the war, we lived in a nice house near Kensington Gardens. There were five of us children. Dad was gone much of the time, working overseas because wages were low in England. He worked construction in Saudi Arabia, Rhodesia, or Kenya, building oil pipelines or roads. Then he went to Canada. Is it from Dad? Yes. When is he coming home? He isn't. We're going there. To Canada? Yes. He got immigration visas for all of us. Canada will be our permanent home. Wow! How soon do we leave? We're going by steamship in 13 days. He made all the arrangements. Steamship? 13 days? It isn't much time. I'll see if the dealer down the street will buy our furniture. Are you really going through with this, Mum? Yes, I am. Well, it looks bad he putting all our things out here on the street. Too bad. I suppose you think I'm mad carting all my goods out here on the street, so I'll tell you why. Hey. The furniture dealer offered me only 300 pounds for everything, when the real value is a thousand or more. Rather than let them cheat me like that, I prefer to give my belongings away to my neighbors. Every last thing. Now then, here's a beautiful sofa, less than two years old. Who wants it? Although Mum needed money from the sale of the furniture for our trip, she was a proud and determined woman. We packed and left London, setting out from Liverpool in February, crossing the Atlantic on rough winter seas. 
Mum was already strained from the ordeal when we docked in Halifax and offloaded our luggage. The bitter cold and deep snows covering the city added to Mum's frustration, and she was unprepared for the trial that lay ahead. Uh, that's your luggage right over there, ma'am, and you say you're going to Toronto by rail? That's right. Are you buying your rail tickets now, then? Our tickets are already bought and paid for. Will you give them to me, please? I beg your pardon? Here. These are the copies of my steamship tickets. When my husband booked passage for us on the ship, he also purchased our first-class rail transportation from Halifax to Toronto. We're supposed to pick up the tickets here, from you. That's impossible, ma'am. We have no knowledge of any such arrangement. You must have. It's all been taken care of. You were misinformed. My husband would not misinform me about such a thing as this. Furthermore, the steamship people at Liverpool knew all about it. Then why didn't they give you the rail tickets? They said that was for you to do, right here. That the transportation was paid for as a single passage, all the way from Liverpool to Toronto, by steamship and by rail. Ma'am, if there was any such arrangement, I'd have been informed. If there was any such arrangement, if, there is no doubt about it. My rail transportation has been bought and paid for, and I want my tickets now. Do you have a receipt? Any sort of supporting evidence? How could I? My husband paid for everything in Toronto while I was still in London. Then he has the receipt? In Toronto. Look, I had no trouble with the steamship people. Why are you being so difficult? Ma'am, there is no record at all of your tickets being prepaid. I suggest that you buy tickets now. Then when you reach Toronto, your husband, who you say has the receipt, can have the matter adjusted by our office in that city. Well, that makes good sense, except for one thing. What's that? I have very little money. Not nearly enough to pay for tickets to Toronto. That is a problem. Uh, Ma'am, I can sell you tickets at a greatly reduced rate, uh, provided you aren't particular about the quality of the transportation. Meaning what? We have a cattle train to Toronto. A cattle train? It has a combination coach and luggage car for the drovers. It is slow, but it'll get you there. The trip takes five days. Oh, what a terrible thing that agent did to you. How long have you been riding? Four days now. After buying the tickets, I had no money. One of my children had a silver dollar that a friend gave her as a gift before we left. I used that to buy bread for the journey. One loaf for five children for oh, five days. Good heavens. Three pieces a day each. Now it's gone. Well, no wonder your daughter was crying so much. They must be starving. Look, I bought a sack lunch. Let me share it with you. The little ones, perhaps. They're so hungry, and thank you for your kindness. I didn't eat anything at all for three days, and neither did my mom. When we finally reached Toronto, my dad learned what happened. He was so enraged, he nearly tore the railroad officers apart with his bare hands. Housing was a problem. The only place we could find at first was in Niagara-on-the-Lake, a shack built for migrant summertime fruit pickers. We were never very warm there. We kids had to travel three miles to school on roads that rarely saw a snowplow. When spring came, there were other problems. There's a very strange odor about this place. I haven't noticed. I don't smell it all the time, but when I do, it's strong and I don't like it. I think it's the cats. What cats? The Canadian cats that live under the house. I haven't seen any cats around here. What are you talking about? Well, they mostly sleep. They're black, and they have a white stripe running down their backs. Skunks! We have skunks living under the house? The skunks were in hibernation, half asleep. But when anything disturbed them, they perfumed the air. Dad did his best to get rid of them by hooking up a long hose to the exhaust pipe of his old car, but the skunks were too tough for him. The day we moved to Crystal Beach, they were still in full possession of their lair under the house. Crystal Beach had different problems. I don't like this place at all. You haven't liked any place we've lived, Karina. We had a beautiful home in London, Ed. I thought you wanted us to be together. I do, 
but not in a dump like this. You want to move again? This will be the twelfth move in five years. Crystal Beach is too wild in the summer. I can't take the drunks and loud parties. It's a resort town. What do you expect? Then let's get out of here to a decent town. I have to be close to work. What about London, Ontario? That's a good-sized town. The poor kids. Changing schools again. We loaded all our possessions, including a German Shepherd dog, into our car, and our entire family moved to London, Ontario. We lived in London six weeks before moving to Fort Erie, where I met Elizabeth. Hey, Eddie. Don't you speak to your friends? Elizabeth! I didn't see you. I was lost in thought. What are you thinking about? Dropping out of school. Really? Oh. I won't see you again. Oh, I know where you live, remember? I'll see you more often. What are you going to do? Get a job. My older brother dropped out, and he's doing okay. That's a big decision, Eddie. Yes, but Mum and I don't get along. I have to get out on my own. I worked for three and a half years as a plumber's apprentice while continuing to see Elizabeth. Then when I was 19, I went to Buffalo, New York, where I enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps. In a moment, we'll hear more about Eddie's service with the Marine Corps. Unshackled is translated into Romanian and broadcast throughout that former communist country where spiritual darkness reigned for decades. Today, the gospel is changing lives as these letters from listeners attest. This man writes, from my teenage years, I've been listening to you with much delight for your program. Why? From each program, I hear stories of people turning their life to God from a lost world, the same way I did. I learned to stay on the course and keep straight on the narrow path with love for our Jesus Christ. God bless you, and thank you for all the examples you transmit. It makes me listen with much love. And this man writes to the radio station, I am 90 years old. For more than five years, I haven't been able to go to church. But through your programs, including Unshackled, my house is full of joy and songs that bring worship to our God. Another listener writes, Please continue this program because this is a blessing to me and others since all these stories are from real cases. God still changes lives and my heart is full of joy. To learn more about this ministry to Romania, write to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. In the Marine Corps, I spent time at Paris Island in Portsmouth, Virginia, then I had one and a half years of sea duty on the anti-submarine carrier Tarawa. All that time, Elizabeth and I stayed in touch. I went to bars with guys where I would buy a beer and let it sit in front of me. I had my own moral code. A man who designed his own yardstick and measured himself with it. After a temporary assignment with the army at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, I went home to marry Elizabeth. A week before the ceremony, the minister counseled us. Do you play golf, Eddie? Uh, no, the Marines aren't famous for their golf. <laughs> Quite right. Too bad, though. Golf is a wonderful game. Well, let's see now. Um, you understand, don't you, that the church doesn't really marry you. You marry yourselves. The church merely solemnizes the marriage and makes it a matter of common knowledge and public record. Yes, Pastor, but... I shouldn't like to be married any place other than in church. Uh, religion is important to you, then? Oh, yes. I've gone to church with my family. Do you play golf, Elizabeth? No. Well, you two have that in common. 